just about four years ago, the scholar of Russian sacred music and editor of Musica Ruska publications, Vlad Morrison, brought to my attention a work by Alexander Kostalsky, the student of Tchaikovsky's, who became one of the most important composers of Russian choral music at the turn of the century. Kostalsky was the leader of a new school of Russian choral singing called the Moscow Synodal School. And he was so revered in the field of choral music that composers such as Rachmaninoff would send him early drafts of their choral works for his comments. When the First World War broke out in 1914, Kostalsky was deeply troubled by the loss of life, not only in Russia, but around the world. He began composing a large-scale requiem that would pay tribute to those who had died in the war. He wanted to represent the Allied nations by having the music sung in different languages and with melodies that represented the different nations. The result was an epic work in 17 movements, written in Italian, French, English, Latin, Russian, and Church Slavonic. It includes instrumental movements that represent Japan and India. There is even an American movement that juxtaposes two great American hymns, Rock of Ages and Hark, Hark, My Soul. As we all listen to this music, we remember the First World War and how a small spark in Europe led to worldwide conflagration. But we also can't help but think of the many people in this country and all over the world who have lost their lives in the current pandemic. Personally, I find that this work shows us the beauty that can be found even in the most difficult of times. Here's a segment from the live performance of the work we gave on October 21st, 2018 in Washington National Cathedral. This is the performance from which we made the world premiere recording of, of the piece that will be released tomorrow. The performance features the Cathedral Choral Society, Kansas City Chorale, the Clarion Choir, St. Tikhon's Choir, and the Orchestra of St. Luke's, with soloists Anna Dennis and Joseph Boutel, all under the baton of Maestro Leonard Slatkin. Leonard Slatkin is one of the most celebrated conductors in the world. He is beloved to Washington audiences, having served as music director of the National Symphony Orchestra from 1996 to 2008. He's also served as music director of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, the National Orchestra of Lyon in France, and the BBC Symphony Orchestra in London. We're so honored that he joined us as the conductor for the Kostalski Project, and also that he could be with us this evening as our honorary chair. I would just like to note that we will have a little bit of time for questions at the end of this interview, so please send us your questions for Maestro Slatkin via the function on YouTube and Facebook. Welcome, Maestro Slatkin. And good evening to you, Maestro. <laughs> so great to have you with us. And before we delve into Kostalski's Requiem, I wanted to ask you about some of your memories in Washington. You were director of music for the National Symphony Orchestra for, for so many years. And I wonder if you have any particular uh, memorable moments from your time in Washington, D.C., musical or otherwise. Well, there were so many. It was 12 years that were extraordinary, getting to meet so many people, both from the diplomatic corps, the political world, but mostly the ones who were concerned with the arts. Washington's a remarkable place. Also, the treasure trove Choral organizations is astonishing. I can't think of another city really that has such monumental forces to draw from all over the area. There was a Mahler 8 we did, which actually combined many of those forces, and that was a significant achievement. When we had a performance of the uh, Piane Children's Crusade, that was another extraordinary moment creating all kinds of festivals. And in particular, I think for me, it was an emphasis on American music, which was to be expected, certainly. But we were able to draw on so many inspirations. Uh, I, had a, I had a ball for those 12 years. It was great fun. And <laughs> I, I hope it was able to leave something of interest for people. Oh, definitely. And uh, J. Riley Lewis was Cathedral Choral Society's music director for more than three decades. And you knew Riley. Um, I thought if you could tell us a little bit about your friendship with him, I believe you met at Juilliard, if I'm not mistaken. And I know you also did some collaborations with Cathedral Choral uh, when it was under his direction. That's correct. 
we met at Juilliard. Uh, we were both students at the time. And then when I came to Washington, he would come to me asking for advice about certain pieces of music techniques. And I came to him as well. I remember an extraordinary session working on the B minor mass of Bach. And although I wasn't planning to conduct it, uh, it was a work I needed to know more about, having done it a couple times in the past. But we also collaborated as performers together. Uh, particularly, I remember a stunning rendition of Barber's Cotta Festiva, where Riley played the organ in this uh, astonishing piece. And we did it in the cathedral, which was important because the premiere of the work was given by Paul Calloway. Um, yeah. he, he was a remarkable person, sadly left us too soon, but yeah. those memories will linger forever. That's really great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, now on to the Kostalski recording. Um, how did you first learn about Kostalski's Requiem and what drew you to participate in the project? And I think for our viewers, it might be interesting to hear what goes into the resurrection of a piece that's been lost or neglected for so many years. Those are two very important questions. For me, the idea of the work actually stemmed from the producer of the recording, Latin Alspa, who had been my producer for almost all the discs I'd made in Detroit. He was remarkable to work with. I, I just love him. And he told me about the composer and the piece. I'd never heard of Kostalski. I, I didn't know why. I went, I looked him up, found uh, some information that actually paired him with my grand uncle, who was a distinguished musician in Russia at the turn of the century named Modest Altschuler. They would have known each other quite well. Uh, <laughs> grand uncle arrived in the States at the turn of the century, but was not a choral conductor. Kostalski, as it turns out, was primarily dealing with the choral works. So Blatton brought it to my attention. I got a copy of the score, such as it was, and looked up the history of the piece, and I became intrigued. Certainly, there was no other work that was like it. It was a war requiem before there was a war requiem. Even yeah. though other composers had tried to commemorate soldiers and others who lost their lives during that war, none took it to the extent that Kostalski did by incorporating 17 of the allied nations. Blanton put me together with various folks, including you. We somehow managed to throw it all together with <laughs> disparate groups from different parts of the country. The amazing thing was how it all came together as quickly as it did, at least for me. We really only did it in two days. Is that right? I think it was just two days of putting it all yeah. together. Yeah, I think the, the, the choirs got together maybe a couple of days before that, but for the very first time, and uh, that's something I wanted to ask you as well. I mean, how, how what was it like uh, being at the helm of all of these different groups? I mean, four different choruses, an orchestra, most of which, most of whom had never actually worked together. But I, I mean, yeah. I certainly remember that first rehearsal when everybody came together and it did click, didn't it, with that first choral rehearsal? I think it probably clicks because the work is unknown. If we'd yeah. had to do say, a Verdi Requiem or barely as whatever it would happen to be, that would be a little complicated because each group would have its own set of performing traditions. Here, yeah. there were none other than Russian colleagues who brought obviously a sense of authenticity and probably helped us with the language a lot. Uh, one other thing has to be said, Kostalski wasn't the best orchestrator in the world. Uh, it wasn't his strength, although there were a lot of great ideas and wonderful things. But as we went along through the rehearsals, we would make some adjustments. We would change a, a texture here, take a few notes out, put others in. Uh, there fortunately were not too many wrong notes that we had to deal with, but there were a few. And it was a kind of, as, as any project like this is, you are dealing with something unknown. It even varies wildly from the single recording that exists of an earlier version. And if I remember right, there are several versions of this piece as well. But this yes. is the only statement. Uh, I found it a very moving experience. It doesn't break a lot of new ground musically, but the simple idea of all these musical styles that float in and out, plus the use of six different languages, 
uh, w was remarkable. And I, I love this. One other thing that was wonderful for the performance for me, it was the last public event that would be attended by the Librarian of Congress, James Billington, Russian yes. scholar. And the fact that he came and I was able to speak with him, that to me was very moving. But also to see so many members of the Russian clergy who came. Uh, yeah. It was a remarkable experience. All the seats were full. There was a feeling of occasion. You don't get that so often these days. Even a Mahler 8, which at one time was a rarity, now is done on a regular basis. I hope, uh, what people don't know, maybe even the choruses don't know, there were plans to take the performance and do it in a couple other cities, including in New York, possibly at the United Nations. Those never yeah. came to fruition, but at least we have this recorded version taken, as you mentioned, from the concerts. There's very little in the way of patching. It's almost exclusively from the concert itself. We try to eliminate as much uh, audience noise, so not too much coughing on this one. Uh, I, I think it's one of the highlights of what's been a very long recording career for me. I truly loved doing this project. Oh, that's so nice to hear. And yes, have you had a chance to listen through to the final product and, and what are your impressions from how it turned out finally? I think as performers, it's always difficult and you need that idea of being able to step back from your yeah. participation and try to listen to it just as somebody approaching this work for the first time. I think it holds up very well. It's odd to have 17 movements, most of which are short. I think the longest movements, what about seven minutes, eight minutes maybe at the yep. most, but there is a flow to it that really works. What I do feel is that we captured the variety of the styles and sound that the composer intended, that there is a real feeling of understanding the Russian choral tradition that exists. This yes. is passed up from so many composers, perhaps best exemplified by the Rachmaninoff Vespers. Uh, but you can feel where a composer like Rachmaninoff would have been heavily influenced by not only what Kostalsky had to teach him, but what he had to offer as a composer of choral music. There's no question that Rachmaninoff is highly influenced, as were so many others. And this was the place of heritage for both sides of my family. So I felt a little connected to the grandparents' homeland. Yes, is that something that you recently discovered, that, that connection that your family has with Kostalski? Well, that, as I mentioned, it goes back to my great uncle, Modest Altschuler. Mm. Uh, even though I've had very little connection with Russian church music, it's always somehow reached me. There was a trip I made in 1976 to the then Soviet Union, and I had to bargain when I was in Kiev to be allowed to go to listen to one of the Russian choirs there, which had uh, become famous for its particularly rich and resonant sound. Uh, what I wanted to do was to be allowed to go to a temple in Russia to see what it was like as a person of the Jewish faith. And we had the bargain. I'm not going to the temple unless you let me go to the church. It was a very strange experience. But this uh, connection is really something I feel very strongly. And now the trips I make to Russia now to conduct always try to include some visit to a church to hear that glorious sound that they produce. That's great. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions now. We do have a few um, from our audience. So the first one, if we take a step back um, and uh, look at the bigger picture about the current situation of classical music now, um, given the pandemic. Question one, uh, Maestro Slatkin, how do you think classical music will be different five years from now in a post-COVID world? Or in a, a world in which there's at least a working vaccine? Well, I think there's a very big change ahead of us. Not necessarily all positive, but a change nonetheless. As you mentioned at the top of this particular gala, we are all experiencing very, very difficult times. We saw today, for example, that several members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, for example, try, have retired. 
maybe they retired a little early and I think you're going to see more people step away from music where I think the biggest impact is going to be is with young people who were hoping to enter the profession either as instrumentalists as singers as teachers it's going to be quite a while before we get to a point where we have so many people who have backgrounds and how do you teach in this day and age how do we audition people to play in our symphony orchestras or sing in our choruses uh, five years from now we'll probably see institutions on the professional level close to what they were but perhaps with a different perspective on the repertoire there's no question that we will continue to exist but it will be the creative forces that were already in place before the virus looking to find new ways to connect members of diverse communities will be even more welcome and perhaps being given more opportunity than they've had in the past and that's very important that should have happened a long time ago now with social unrest hopefully leading to a confluence of ideas will bring us closer together and i think to some degree even with political turmoil going on i think the world will become closer together in the terms of music understanding cultures through their music is really one way to get closer to a more peaceful planet yeah lovely and um we have another question that just came in i think you probably just answered it but as a leader in your field what gives you hope i think you've just mentioned that you know the well, pandemic is unique yeah, yeah but what can you tell you from the past that gives you hope for what's next what gives me hope in particular is that segment you had earlier watching young people making yeah. music together there is no other profession where people get to come together from all different kinds of backgrounds for the purpose of unifying yourself in the service of great good and sometimes not so good music but it's that kind of teamwork nobody's working as an individual here we're working as a unit and I still see so much enthusiasm in young people, no matter what the form, the genre, uh, the arts are for everyone. Or as Washington born Duke Ellington used to say, there are only two kinds of music, good music and the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, changing subject for a moment, someone's asking, what are you working on right now? Well, I just finished writing my third book. Thank you for the question. Now it's going to go into the editing phase and then it'll probably come out in September, I think. Uh, fourth book is on the way. It will be a little bit different kind of book. The third one is to address kind of 50 years of looking at the profession of classical music, seeing how it's changed for the good and sometimes not in my opinion i've been doing some composing as well i continue to study i'm no longer a music director anywhere and that's actually for me good my wife is a distinguished composer cindy mctee so we collaborate on various projects i've enjoyed doing score study sessions with conductors from around the world obviously you can't teach conducting unless you have a group there to work with but you can do a lot in terms of examining pieces of music and looking at them and maybe the experience of so many years in the profession gives me a little bit of a leg up some ideas i might had i've also been trying to think of a way that we can encourage education on the public school level which has been gradually deteriorating over the past 45 years uh, I remember when I came to Detroit as the music director, I met immediately with the director of public schools who bragged that 30% of the students in Detroit public schools had music education in the classroom. And I immediately said, that means 70% don't. Comparing yeah. that to when I was a kid, in my high school, public high school, we had three choruses, two bands. We had an orchestra and Peter Shickley was our composer in residence at public high school. Wow. Well, we have to remember how important all the arts are to a vital society. And it starts at the school level at the youngest ages. Again, it doesn't matter what kind of music 
we are listening to and we're studying. It's always a part of art creating and working with the history of what great civilizations are about. And if we're to go down in the world as one of the great civilizations, we have got to imbue the spirit of the arts into the public school curriculum. Thank you. That's such an important message. Thank you for that. We're just about out of time, but I'm going to ask you, I'm going to combine two quick questions into one is if someone has time to listen to just one track from the CD, is there a favorite part that you remember? We just heard a little bit of the ending, but is there a favorite yeah. part? And then is there a particular piece of Russian music you might suggest for the, us? The great uh, <laughs> uh, moment that people in this country, at least, are going to be surprised is the one additional movement that was devoted to the American cause during the war. It was mentioned that you have two hymns, Rock of Ages and the, the other one. But the surprise was Chopin's funeral march taken from his second right. piano sonatas there. I had no idea, because apparently Kostalski researched this and discovered that the funeral march of bam, bam, da, da, bam, ba, da, was often performed at funerals in America. I had yes. no idea. It was the American extraordinary mission to Russia that went over in 1916 to show support for the provisional government in Russia at that time. And Kostalski somehow met them, probably in Moscow or St. Petersburg, and apparently they told him this. They said, he asked them, what, what do people play and sing at funerals in America? And they told him they play the funeral march from Chopin's Sonata. So, <laughs> it's a funny One juxtaposition. Request. When my time on this planet is up, do not play the funeral march of Chopin. I get that played usually with my birthday, which is next two, five days from now. Don't play it, <laughs> leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, an early happy birthday to you. And thank you so much for, for serving as our honorary chair this evening and uh, for being part of this online gala and for being part of this really exciting, important recording that comes out tomorrow. We're all so grateful to you, and we were really honored to work with you on it. So it was a um, distinct pleasure. I had such a great time with all of you. Hope we can do it again. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll stay with us for, we're, we're, for the remainder of the evening. We'll have a little toast at the end, so please, please stay we'll with us.